Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Pan Future Society podcast. I am your host, Sean. It is Saturday, August 13th, 2016, and this is the Baker's Dozenth episode of the show, number 13. And thank you for hanging out with me on uh, whatever day you happen to be listening to this, at whatever time of day. I'm going to start the show today with a poem. The title is Computer. Computer by a roadside in the river where you go back into the houses of sand. As I do in a valley of wood with my garden, I am a small man who is the first, the same of your body, and you see a certain big moving of my body, as in my hand, in your hands, do they know? They know, but that the sun and rain has burnt a light of day as mine own hair. Tonight the darkness has taken the place from a world, and you do but look out at Rest at my side, to my eyes, that my life will take the world with my eyes. In vain I would be, I would not forget. I could see what it came for, the moment to live today, and so do they do the first, for that they might not say, but the day for their souls, as if they might have a breath." They thought not a word that made of one thing, that is to make it, to pass it, but that in each day a day it is. That was the poem Computer, written by Deep Gimbal One. Deep Gimbal One is a proof-of-concept recurrent neural net, minimally trained on public domain poetry and seeded with a single word. Uh, A very abstract poem, uh, more for fans of the postmodernist style. Um, Meaning is not obvious, but uh, there's a website called Curated AI, curatedai curatedai.com. There's a number of uh, items of poetry and prose written by various AI programs and computers, and I find it fascinating... um, some of them are really quite good in in context of comparison to uh, some human written poetry, maybe a little bit abstract. Uh, some of them are a little bit funny or a little bit odd uh, because of their exact phrasing. But to, to think that we are at a state now where we're this close to having excellent literature written by computers is really quite remarkable. Uh, this will lead into uh, today's later topic of artificial intelligence, but right now, your news of the moment. All right, your news today. Uh, You may recall uh, several months back uh, speculation about an alien megastructure around a star that was under observation by the Kepler telescope. This star had uh, very odd dips in its brightness. Kepler detects planets by detecting their transit in front of a star, so the, the brightness of the star drops very slightly when a planet passes in front of it. And Kepler can determine uh, with that information how big the planet is roughly or how far away it is from the sun or how long its orbit might be. The star, KIC 8462852, uh, which is uh, 1480 light years away in the constellation Cygnus, the star is also nicknamed Tabby's star after the astronomer who uh, led the team uh, looking at this. And I will call it Tabby's star rather than KIC 8, 6, blah, blah, blah. Um, Anyway, uh, they looked at the star and it had some unusual dips in its brightness, which were not normal for a planet passing in front of it. Um, Some ideas were floated, uh, including one, which may be a stretch uh, for some, the idea of an alien megastructure around the star something like a Dyson sphere or a Dyson ring or some, you know, massive uh, 
construction in space used to uh, gather as much energy from the star as possible or uh, to provide living surfaces as something like the Larry Niven's ring world or uh, you know even if it was just solar panels uh, you would be able to trap uh, an enormous amount of energy if your solar panels were uh, gigantic uh, things in space. Um, there were some other explanations that were possible, like uh, various uh, clusters of dust, um, clouds of comets passing uh, in front of the star, and... Um, meteors, various other uh, space debris that could be a little bit more random than a planet. Well, it turns out uh, we don't really know. We still don't have any definitive answer. But this star keeps getting stranger. Uh, Kepler has detected more drops in the light output from Tabby's star as large as 20%, which is enormous. Um a light drop of 1% would be more in line with what you would see with a gas giant. So 20% is huge. And uh, even more puzzling is over time, the total light output has been dropping at a nonlinear rate. Uh, that is to say that the light dips and it comes back, but it's really not coming back brighter uh, as bright as it was before. Uh, the article I am referencing here says, for the first thousand days of Kepler's observation, Tabby's star was losing 0.34% uh, brightness annually. In the 200 days following that, it dropped by 2% before leveling off. A total drop in 3% in addition to the transit-like drops of 20% is incredibly bizarre. Um... An astronomer, uh, Bradley Schaefer of Louisiana State University, has claimed that an examination of old photographic plates of Tabby's star has indicated that its brightness had dropped by almost 20% in the last century. Other scientists are skeptical of this claim, but now we have, uh, through Kepler, some corroboration that the star is overall getting dimmer. So that is not normal behavior for any kind of a star. Um, unless perhaps you are directly drawing uh, hydrogen off the star, I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna speculate out there that this is a uh, Galactus from the Marvel universe who is is feeding. Normally he feeds on planets. Maybe he's extra hungry today. He's feeding on a star. Uh, this is very interesting and continues to be a very mysterious star that uh, Kepler has its eye on, and I will look forward to more news about Tabby's star uh, popping up in the coming months, and I will bring it to you here on your News of the Moment. All right, in this week's main segment... An Introduction to Artificial Intelligence Artificial intelligence is changing our world in ways we're not even aware of. In this first of several shows, we'll get a primer in what AI is, how it develop was developed, and what kinds of things people are using it for right now. As evidenced by the poem at the top, there's almost no area of human experience that isn't being influenced, assisted, and changed by artificial intelligence. What is AI? It is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines and computer programs. From Wikipedia, quote, in computer science, an ideal intelligent machine is a flexible, rational agent that perceives its environment and takes actions that maximize its chances of success at some goal, end quote. It's not always about passing the Turing test or having a natural conversation with a robot, although that is a branch of AI research. More generally, AI is a system that allows a machine or a program to be self-guided and adjust to changing situations without the intervention of a person, and as machine learning grows as a field, these AIs will be able to expand their abilities and adaptations. 
the Photoshop program on my computer isn't an AI because it requires me to provide input. If you had a program that could, for example, choose its own photo edits without your input, that would be a form of AI. And as humans and animals have varying degrees and types of intelligence, so do AI systems. As artificial intelligence develops, certain functions that were once considered AI are now part of routine technology, such as OCR text recognition or simple if-then processes in a space probe that is too far away to wait for human input in any given situation. For example, uh, the Juno space probe at Jupiter is probably able to put itself into a safe mode if it detects aberrations in its functioning. This is a form of AI, but it's so rudimentary we don't think of it that way anymore. Uh, like breathing, we require a certain amount of biological processing power to do it, but we don't necessarily consider it part of our intelligence. An important side benefit of researching AI is that we are also learning more and more about how our own intelligence and our own brains work. Arthur R. Jensen, a leading human intelligence researcher, has included speed, short-term memory, and the ability to form accurate and retrievable long-term memories as essential aspects of intelligence. Computers certainly have a lot of speed and memory, but the challenge is to combine those abilities to make accurate predictions. And that is in many ways what humans do. We call upon past experience to form an image of the world, which we use to form expectations about what will happen in the next second, the next day, next year. In recent years, scientists have made great strides in developing mechanisms for machines to put knowledge to use. A basic definition of intelligence is helpful. One way to look at it is it's the computational ability to achieve goals. And that's the very nuts and bolts definition. And it's worth noting that we're not talking about personality or consciousness as we define it in humans. Whether or not an intelligent machine has a personality or is a conscious being is, for one, a hugely debatable question, but is also separate from whether or not it has intelligence. The central problems and goals of AI research are reasoning, knowledge, planning, learning, natural language processing and communication, perception, and in the case of machines, not just software, the ability to move and manipulate objects. The AI field draws on computer science, math, psychology, linguistics, linguistics, philosophy, neuroscience, and artificial psychology. I think AI can also be considered an extension of computer science, robotics, and programming rather than a wholly new field. Some types of AI currently being researched and used are logical AI, search engines, uh, pattern recognition, representation, inference, common sense knowledge and reasoning, learning from experience, planning, epistemology, ontology, heuristics, and genetic programming. Forgive the big word salad there. I will do uh, more, I'll get more into detail about those branches of AI in some future shows. The history of artificial intelligence is far longer than you may think. Wikipedia has an AI timeline that I'll link to in the show notes, but much like my earlier discussion on science fiction, elements of AI, intelligent machines, and robots can be traced back to ancient Greece, China, and the Middle East. Some of these early notions are mythology and fiction, some are machines with computer-like functions, and some are linguistic in nature. Of particular note on that last item is Aristotle's description of syllogism, a method of formal logical thought. Not only does this describe the way humans examine the world, it's the type of idea that actually lies at the core of computer programming. An example of a syllogism often given is, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. This kind of logical thinking is at the very heart of programming. 
The step that AI aims to take is to allow machines to then determine if Abraham Lincoln, Santa Claus, Elizabeth Taylor, and Mr. Spock would also or would not fit the scenario. I wouldn't be surprised if a rudimentary AI would conclude Elizabeth Taylor to be immortal because she is a woman, not a man. Many of the hurdles faced by AI seem almost comical to us, or just common sense, but that is mostly because we have grown up learning. Would a three-year-old be able to tackle Aristotle's approach or pass a Turing test? Our own intelligence must be trained and grown, and so it is with machines. It is thought the earliest uh, example generally recognized as AI was McCullough and Pitt's 1943 formal design for a Turing-complete uh, artificial neurons. Programmers as early as the 1950s were working toward artificial intelligence, programming computers that beat people at checkers and could prove logical theorems. However, in the 1970s, many of the problems of trying to copy human brain function to a computer caused progress to stall, and quite a bit of research funding was lost. In the 1980s, commercial computing systems called expert systems once again put AI research into motion. These computers were programmed with knowledge and analytical skills to simulate human experts. The microcomputer boom through the mid to late 1980s ended this branch of AI use. Uh, starting again in the late 1990s through today, though, AI research and development has picked up the pace and made very rapid developments. It's being used for data mining, medical diagnosis, and advanced problem solving, and some of the more well-known examples of AI uh, in the public eye are Deep Blue, beating chess champ Garry Kasparov uh, back in 1997, I think, and uh, Watson winning on Jeopardy. Both of those were IBM computers. Uh, one significant way many of us uh, use AI all the time is in a search engine. Google and others use algorithms to perform search tasks that are organized in ways that wouldn't be possible with simple brute force programming. An extension of that search AI is your smartphone's Siri or Cortana or whatever you have on your phone that you can talk to to perform searches and other functions. Some of the improvement in AI in recent years can be attributed to the availability of high-speed internet and the massive amount of data that is now online. Uh, that's something that the uh, AIs that are being used for things like medical diagnosis and even uh, also law practice, imagine you being a law librarian or a researcher trying to take in the entire history of law, even in a single country or a single state. Uh, it's massive. And an AI is able to correlate data uh, much more efficiently than people do. In fact, recently, uh, maybe this will be on the news soon, a woman uh, was diagnosed by IBM's Watson. Uh, she had a form of leukemia that a number of other doctors had not been able to treat properly because her particular variety of leukemia uh, was rare. Uh, Watson actually pinpointed the exact uh, type that she had, and she is under treatment now. Um, I, you know, doctors are, are great, and they're highly trained, but even, even a dozen doctors can't instantly have access to every medical diagnosis ever made. And that's what uh, AI is doing for us. So, uh, to wrap up the show for today, uh, I just want to re-emphasize that artificial intelligence is not like a regular computer program, although sometimes it can seem like it. It is, if it's just a computer in a box doing something, um, <clears throat> it can be hard to tell the difference between uh, what a regular computer does and what an artificial intelligence does. But the main point... Um, aside from putting the AI into a robot that walks around and does things on its own, which I think we could clearly define as AI, um, artificial intelligence uh, gives programs 
an independence and a flexibility and ability to adapt to different situations. So keep your eyes open in the real world for examples of AI, whether you're uh, talking to your phone to get some directions or playing a chess game or uh, maybe a first-person shooter where there's NPCs chasing after you. Uh, that is also a form of AI. So watch out for the AI out there. Uh, they're probably going to help you, uh, but only if you ask very nicely. All right, that is your show for the week. Thanks once again for joining me on the Pan Future Society podcast. Come visit us online at panfuture.org. Uh, email me, Sean, S-E-A-N, at panfuture.org. Come find us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, I do quite a bit of tweeting of various other news items that you might find interesting during the week uh, that I don't blog about or put in the show. So uh, that's probably the most active spot uh, right now for the show is the Twitter feed. So tweet, tweet at me. Um, so what is it? At, at Pan Future Cast, I guess is what it's called. And uh, yes, once again, uh, thank you for joining me for this week's show. And I will talk to you again in the future. Music